Mike, over to you to run the meeting. Okay, you can hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Good. Um, well, our speaker this afternoon is very well known and a very enthusiastic member of the Royal and of the Philatelic and Postal History World of India. Uh, Mark Andave should be well known to most of you. He's um, always coming up with new ideas to promote the hobby. He's a regular international exhibitor and a meticulous researcher. And you'll find that out in the next few minutes. So, Mark, hand over to you. Thank you, Mike. So good afternoon, everybody in England and good evening in India and wherever you are in the world. Today, we are going to talk about the 1929 airmail stamps of India. And what you will see in this presentation today, very simple, the artist's sketches, the basic elements of the stamp design, the postal notices and the circulars, what they have issued, the first take hours of 4th November and 20th December and techniques that how to identify the position without a complete sheet and some of my favorite errors and the position on the sheet. Now here on this sheet, we have the big item of the artist sketch. We had the drawing competition for the 1929 airmail stamps of India in 1928. And total 77 participants have participated. However, you will see 75 on the list as number 10 has A and B with the three entries, 10, 10A and 10B. This is the entry which you are seeing in the center was submitted by T. Archer. And he was working in the security printing press at Nasik. He was one of the chief engraver of the stamps. The very first entry was submitted by the well-known Indian aerophilatelist Stephen Smith on 3rd of August, 1928. Here we will see that how the stamp was designed. When they announced the drawing competition, they said that there should be some of the airmail content. So they had the aircraft, obviously King George V, because at that time he was uh, the emperor of India, and they have taken the design of this Vihar Lake, which was near Bombay. Now, this information, what you are seeing on the screen, has been gathered by me from the National Archive from New Delhi. During the process of the printing of the stamp, once upon a time, there was a question arise that from where the King George V's portrait has been derived. And in one of the correspondence, they responded that it is derived from the present five rupees bank note. And the background, what we will see in the stamp design, that is a lake that was also in the question. And they said that, that this is the lake near Bombay. And here is the postcard of the Vihar Lake in which we see the lake, the, the mountains and the palm trees. And the aeroplane obviously the Dea Havilland Hercules DH-66. Now, this is the very first entry of the drawing competition submitted by Mr. Stephen Smith. On the bottom right, you will see F-A-Y, Fay, and that's the nom de plume of Mr. Smith. Fay Harcourt was the name of Stephen's wife, and that is the reason he chosen this nom de plume for his entry. Now, when this particular uh, drawing was offered to me to, and I was thinking of to add it in my collection, I rejected initially considering it as a Cinderella. But when I come across with the National Archive and I came to know that uh, the nom de plume of Stephen's uh, entry was Faye, and then I realized that this uh, particular drawing has the Faye word on the bottom right corner, then I realized what exactly it is. And furthermore, 
I gathered this information from the Museum of Communication in Switzerland, Bern, where Stephen has sent a letter to Dr. Robert Paganini, who was a very dear friend of Stephen Smith and also a well-known aerophilatist in that time. And he was constantly in touch with Stephen Smith re uh, regarding all the aero activities, whatever Mr. Smith was doing in India um, with pigeon mail, rocket mail, and obviously air mail. So here he sent one of the photographs of his design to Mr. Robert Paganini in Switzerland. And the bottom left, he made a little note that my nom de plume is fake. This is on the right bottom corner of each photographs. So he sent some photographs to Robert Paganini. And that's how I uh, concluded the drawing, which we have seen earlier, that belongs to Mr. Stephen Smith. Now, here are the five entries submitted by the designer uh, who was uh, in security printing press at NASIC. So you will see uh, on the bottom two designs that compared to the top one, okay, the one on the top left and the one on the top right, that the gateway of India was then later also replaced by the Indian map. Not only the Indian map, it was, uh, uh, it was an attempt to show the airmail route with highlighting the names of the cities inside it. And this is what we have just discussed. And in one of the paragraph of the correspondence, when the question was arised, they replied to the financial department in London that the landscape inserted in the design is actually a reproduction of one of the lakes near Mumbai. And now we can compare the photograph and the crop image of the photograph with these hills and the lake and the palm trees looks almost similar. Okay, now as we discussed, mm -hmm. total 77 entries yeah. were submitted, first by Stephen Smith, who lost. Ultimately, Mr. Grant oh. was the winner with his entry number 38. However, Mr. Grant has also submitted one another entry, entry number 66, and his nom de plume was best try, but the best try didn't work. However, the luck at last worked. The entry number 38 and its nom de plume was luck at last. How nice and funny and interesting this story is. So here is the design and uh, which won the competition. And this is serial number 38 in the competition submitted by Mr. Grant. And he is writing here just above this stamp, which is uh, pasted on this uh, pencil drawing. Mr. Grant is writing, this is my original rough sketch. Later on, he presented this sketch to Mr. Smith. So on the right side, you can see the crop image of the reverse of this uh, drawing, which was acknowledged by Mr. Smith on 9th December, 1929. And now we will come to the postal notices, some more technical things. And it's a very interesting story that they issued total three postal notices, also one circular in between. And uh, because the, the release of the stamp was getting delayed and delayed. And that's how uh, it, it becomes interesting. So the first postal notice they issued on the 1st October 19, sorry, 5th September 1929, saying that the stamps will release on 1st of October. But then on 20th September, they come up with another notice and say that now instead of the 1st October, the stamp will be released on 1st November. They also released one circular after the second postal notice with a little bit more clarification where they have clearly mentioned that these stamps will not be recognized in payment of postal charges for the transmission of articles by routes other than by air. So these stamps were exclusive for only airmail, airmail and airmail. Finally, after the two unsuccessful attempts, Mr. Rogers came with the third and final notice on 1st of October, 
that the stamps will be available from 4th November. Do remember they issued three, four, six, eight, and 12 annas and not the two annas, and which you will see here. So the finally stamps were released and here we have all the five stamps with the sign of the designer in the salvage area. And here we have the first day cover of those five stamps released on 4th November, 1929. Interestingly, this cover is addressed to Gertrude Collins, sent by Stephen Smith. And later, Stephen fired a rocket mail in name of Gertrude Collins, because Gertrude Collins was also a well-known aero collector, uh, airmail collector. And uh, this was happened on 26th of June, 1938, when Stephen fired a rocket. On the reverse of the cover here, you will see that this cover is also signed by the designer of the stamp, Mr. Grant. Now we come to the two annas, and two annas was the rate for the domestic air mail. So the mails which will be um, trans, uh, transmitted within India, and this will be treated with the two annas postal rate. And here we have the circular that the two annas stamp will be released on 20th of December. Okay, so 4th November 1929, the five stamps, and on 20th December, we had the two annas. Again, a beautiful first day cover with signature of the designer, Mr. Grant, on the top, and the date 20th December 1929. Address to Stephen Smith. Okay, I had also published a book jointly with my father and my sister, which is in Royal Library at the moment. And I printed thousand copies in year 2015, all sold in one year, 225 errors listed. Here are the statistics. And then I was continuously researching that the errors what I have discovered can I find a multiple block to prove it that it is constant and this is the position, which we will see now here that in absence of the complete sheet, because I tried my best to find out that if I can find some of the complete sheets of any of the values, but unfortunately, I'm searching it for last 15 years and I haven't seen a single sheet so far. So this is just a digital reproduction that if the seat is available, then how it will look like the printing format was 12 into 12, total 144 stamps. And on the right side, we have two guide marks. On the left side of the seat, we have two more guide marks in the margin area. And what are the guide marks and how they look like? They look like this. Now, the important thing when I have studied these guide marks, that the one which is on the which is on the row six, which is coming from the top side, it is falling on the top position in the margin area, and which is on the bottom side, I mean on the row seventh, it is on the bottom side within the margin area. So even with having just one stamp, you can uh, say that on which particular position it falls. This is the guide mark on the left side of the seat. And we will see some more example to understand it even better. So now here on the top left, we have this guide mark, but it is on the bottom side of the stamp. So obviously that is falling on row seven and we can see it's a column number one. Here on the bottom block, which is falling on the top side in the margin area, it means it's row six. Again, here on the right side, that is row six. And the big block on the extreme right can help us that how exactly the situation is that why it is row six, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So it is falling on the top side of the, of the stamp within the margin area, and that is row six. Now here it's very clear, row six and row seven, you can clearly see that the one falling on row six 
is on the top side in the margin area and the one on the bottom is on row seven. And it's same on every single value, whether it is three annas, two annas, four, six, eight, or 12 annas. And we have another block of the four ana on the right side for further clarification. Okay, interestingly, a part of the set, two, three, four, and six annas, was overprinted with Kuwait and a supply was sent. Very little amount of uh, seats were overprinted. Uh, in two annas, we had 73, three annas, 334, four annas, only 23 seats. And for the six annas, we don't have the number exactly, but this set was overprinted, uh, part of the set, sorry, was overprinted with Kuwait because the Kuwait post office was under the control of the Bombay GPO. After the partition, it was being administered by Pakistan. Here we have on the top uh, um, thing, we have the three listed varieties in the Stanley Gibbons catalog. One, which is the Q, okay, in the postage, O becomes Q. The second one is the treetop missing variety, which is a very popular one. And the third one is the reverse serif. Apart from these three varieties, when I published the book, Stanley Gibbons took a serious note of it. And uh, I was fortunate that they included this two, in fact, four, and I will tell you why there are four varieties in their book. So the first varieties they have included, that is the second eye of India looks like a numeral one, and which is they have listed as SG221B. And that also exists with the Kuwait overprint. So that is why it's two, okay, here. And the arc variety, which, uh, which is uh, passing all the way from the bottom where the T of the postage, and going all the way top and crossing L of mail and passing through all the way to the stamp. And that also with the Kuwait overprint, and that's how it makes four. Now we will see here that without the guide mark, even with the help of the margin area, okay, how I have identified the position. So this is the type 23 in my book. And when I discovered this block, I realized that it is falling on the row one and column one. There is a pulse flow about the A of IR breaking all the diagonal bars and about the tail of the airplane. And here about the numeral two, the frame lines are broken. On the right block, we have the type 73 which is falling on the row 10 and column 11. There are, uh, there are three uh, horizontal frames are broken in between P and O of postage. Interestingly, and luckily I have Michael Sefi here today, and uh, I have noticed this variety, the numeral one variety in the Royal Collection, when I met Michael you know, on 1st November, 2013 to see the Royal Collection. I was actually there to see that and study the two Anas because I was studying the one Anna watermark at that time. And Michael was very kind. And uh, he asked me that if I want to see anything else. And then I said, obviously, I like this uh, 1929 airmail stamps and I would like to study it. And I have noticed that there is one example is there in the Royal Collection. Obviously, the collection was belongs to our beloved patron at that time, Her Majesty. Queen Elizabeth II, and here we have the picture. Now, this variety, the numeral one variety, okay, this block proves the position. The left side block, we, if we see it on the top right, we have this numeral one variety. So that is on the row one and column 12. So the position is confirmed, and it is, I have supplied the data to Stanley Gibbons also, and uh, they have mentioned it in their catalog. Now, something, some puzzles 
which inspires me and uh, which keeps me going on is like this, the block in the center. We have this extra spoke variety, okay, which is not recorded, in, recorded yet in my book. I have found it on nearly eight to nine examples with and without Kuwait overprint altogether, but I'm not able to reach uh, to the conclusion to find out the column because I have this just bottom marginal block. So I know it is happening on the row 12, but which column that I don't know yet. On the extreme right side, we have this nice block of eight, which clearly confirms the position of my type 12, which is falling on the row three and column two. And this variety, since it is on the basic stem, it exists with and without Kuwait overprint both. Now, another thing. This is the type two in my book, which is falling on the row 12 and column four. One more variety apart from the Q variety, which is a little pearl flow on the R of air. Now the Q variety, this one, the Q variety was listed under India section only and not under the Kuwait section. I was curious that if the error is occurred on the basic stem and why doesn't it is there in the Kuwait section until and unless the particular uh, seat is not overprinted with Kuwait and supply was sent. I was curious and I was fortunate to acquire this block which proves that it also exists in Kuwait. I sent again the information to Stanley Gibbons and now it is there in the catalog. So this is one of the discovery. Now, since the mint example is exist, I was curious that there should be used and also possibly a cover. And I was fortunate to acquire this cover with Q variety overprinted with Kuwait, okay, going to United States of America. I'm sure you cannot see the Q variety nicely, so what I did is I put some LED light on the uh, within the within the cover, putting it in, and try to click a picture using my mobile. And here you can see the Q variety. The next one is about the forgeries of the overprint, because the four anas printed in a very lower quantity. Sometimes, however, even the forgeries are rare, but sometimes you come across with the forgery. Now to identify the forgery, usually they are not dark black. The overprint pattern is rough and in bold text with a grayish black little overprint type. The genuine one, which is underneath, an example with a sharp and proper black, clear black overprint. This one. Okay, now <clears throat> another interesting thing. This, both of the stamp on the part of the cover are with double impression. This is listed under the Kuwait section of Stanley Gibbons. And I was uh, fortunate to acquire this from eBay, this nice piece. Both of the stamps are printed double and on part cover. The top stamp, which is this one, also in the enlarged image, it also has the type 38 from my book that the frames, the, the frame bars are broken on the bottom left under underneath the floral ornament. And that is falling on the row eight and column four. This is the position of that particular error. But however, here we have the double impression variety, which is the extra bonanza. Now it's completely other way around. What we discussed about the Q variety, okay, since it was under India section and not in Kuwait, here I was thinking that if the double impression variety, the basic stamp is printed double and that was listed under Kuwait only, why not under India? And it gave me more energy to searching it. And finally, I was lucky to acquire this example 
from one of the auction house in Britain. And this is listed in my book as type 45, the basic stamp printed double without the Kuwait overprint. I have sent the information to Stanley Gibbons, but I think they have not included it yet in the catalog. Now we will talk about the four anas. The other values apart from the four anas has the sales, but lighter and darker and not distinctive like four anas. All other values. Four anas has the multiple colors nearly five to six. And if I want to uh, clarify that how distinctive the shades are, that in some of the time, the changes in the shades of the four anas are remarkable as they appear to sometime if the four anas printed in the shade of six anas. But altogether, there is a good shade range variety in four anas. That's what I have noticed. We will again see some of my favorite varieties. This is a uh, type 12 frame broken, the letter bar actually underneath the O and S of the postage. And that is falling on the row 12 and column one. Now you can, this marginal block helps me that this is the column one and row 12 because it is the bottom left side. This is the bottom right side of the block, the large pearl flow variety above the first eye of India. And that is type 28 from you know, my book. And that is falling on the row 11 and column 12. Now we have seen this arc variety earlier. So when I uh, discovered this variety, I was under impression that it is just a one variety. But one day I purchased this big block and I noticed that it has the arc variety. So I was able to find out and locate the position, not only the position, when during my careful study, I realized that this arc is not just on this one uh, stamp and it is passing through all the way and touching the bottom part of the upper stamp as well and touching the top part of the lower stamp as well. So altogether, there are three varieties. And now, since if the one variety is, uh, we have identified the position, all of the three varieties are obviously constant. And with the position, later I discovered those varieties as well uh, in the single example, as well as on cover. Here we go to eight anas and uh, type one from my book, a very nice flaw on the bottom loop of eight. And that is again constant. This bottom corner marginal block proves the position row 12 and column one. Now the tree top missing variety, which I'm showing on the right side. Interestingly, whenever you will come across of the tree top missing variety in format of the vertical pair, do carefully study the bottom stamp. It also has a little dash in between I and L of May. And that is, if the tree top is constant, this is also constant. I have studied nearly 16 pairs and every single pair has this variety. Okay, now we will talk about the 12 anas and here we will discuss type 25, type 28 and type 26. The type 25, there are pearls between the A of last letter of India A and the first letter of postage P. Okay, that is type 25. The broken lines behind King's portrait, that is type 28. And a plate scratch on the center of the floral ornament, that is type 26. So I had all these singles and multiples, nearly seven, eight example of each. When I discovered this block, it exploded that where exactly the position of those errors are falling. This is a bottom left marginal block. And this is the first column. This is the second column. And all of these varieties are falling on third column. One, the top one is falling on the row nine, row 10. And the type 26 is falling on the row 12. Okay, 
In the same design of this airmail stamp, we had the postal stationery. Okay. <clears throat> and I was obviously curious to study the varieties in the stationery as well. And this is the only one variety I was able to find and which is constant. I have nearly seen 50 plus examples. The dot between A and I of the air, letter air. Okay. Now here I am showing two versions, one with the eight anas on the right side and later on the rate was reduced to seven and a half anas. So the variety appears there as well. And here we will see the first day cover and again with the variety. The first day usage of the eight anas postal stationery was 1st May 1930. We also had the postcard, this one, the four Anas postcard, which is the world's first airmail stationary postcard. However, I was, I'm not able to find any errors in this postcard, but here we will see the first day usage of the world's first airmail stationary postcard when it was sent from Bombay by mistake, they put the insufficiently paid for transmission by airmail marking, but when they realized that this is the new reduced rates postcard, they removed it and strike, struck it out with the blue crayon and finally decided that this postcard is good to go. And this is the last and the latest known usage to me obviously, from Kuwait, interestingly, without the Kuwait overprint, because here we have the full set, and which is giving us an impression that this may be a philatelic cover. However, it is not. Why? Because it has the correct postage rate, three and a half annas for the surface, 29 annas for the air fee, three annas for the registration fee, total 35 annas, and plus the King George six. Uh, half anna, which you can see on the reverse uh, of the cover, along with the six label. And as I mentioned earlier about the Kuwait post office, that it was being administered by the Bombay GPO, okay, until the partition, when India became independent in August, then it started being administered by the Pakistan. What you have seen in this presentation is exactly, I'm showing you what you will see in this presentation today in the beginning. And this is these are the things we have seen in this presentation today. And this, will, this is for those who will be watching the recording in the YouTube and still have questions because today you guys have an opportunity to put it in the chat box. But if somebody is showing, uh, seeing it later, they can scan the QR code and reach to me and ask uh, about any clarification they are looking for. Thank you very much indeed to everybody. And Mark, over to you now. Thank you, Mark And And that was a really very interesting uh, explanation of all those stamps. Um, and the good news is, that we've got one sort of question stroke comment that's come in. Um, actually, a couple, to be fair, a couple of questions from the same person. Um, this is from Dr. Clifford Williams, who I don't know. I mean, Clifford and I were exchanging chat. We're not quite sure whether he's got the latest catalogue, but he says that the Stanley Gibbons catalogue gives the release date of these stamps as the 22nd of October, 1929. And so he, he says, is, should, that, should that be corrected to the 4th of November? <laughs> he is right. See, I, I discussed this with you, Jeffries, many times, that we have all this data and I have shown him all this information, including the postal notices in the first day cover as an evidence. But for some reason, it's uh, coming all the way from the old days and they are not changing it. It's as simple as that. But I know this mistake in Gibbons catalog. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Clifford also was, um, he noted that the name of the designer in the catalogue is shown as R. Grant. That should be G Grant, shouldn't G it? G Grant, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, he is right, yeah. <laughs> Again, he is right. It's R Grant in Given Scatter, yeah. All right, thank you for that, and thank you, Clifford, for for your questions. They they do help clarify uh, the situation there. Um, no one else has asked any questions, so this must mean that your explanation has left everybody very clear on <laughs> uh, on matters relating to these stamps. And um, that being the case, Mike, I think it's fair to say that we've finished the questions. Um, I'd like to hand back to you. OK, well, thank you very much. I think everybody will agree that Mark has got a great command of his computer software. <laughs> Judging with all the colours and arrows and everything that you've used, it's very good. Thank you. Anyway, you've taken us through the design process. The birth of the stamp, the story of the of the late design, the postal notices, which has uh, obviously come back to haunt Stanley Gibbons, uh, the printing format, the reasons for the Kuwait overprint, um, and the usages. But and it's big but, isn't it? <laughs> Most of all, you've spent an enormous amount of time reconstructing blocks and sheets and looking for all the small varieties that you can possibly imagine. And you've illustrated them really well so we can see uh, where they arise. And for all that, um, thank you very much indeed. So we've all learned quite a bit. So. Mark, and thank you very much indeed for this afternoon's lecture. Um, I'd now like to hand over to our president, Peter Coburn, who I think is, would like to present you with something and uh, maybe have a few words of his own. Thank, thank you. you. I don't know what's happened to my picture. Um, my name is clear. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Peter, uh, we can hear you. I don't know what's happened to my video because I switch it on or off and it doesn't seem to make any difference. So we clearly have a small issue there, but um, I can assure you it's me and not an AI machine. Um, and uh, Mark and I've enjoyed your show very much indeed. Um, it's the enthusiasm which you show, which is so impressive. And um, they're very beautiful stamps. Um, you've brought them to life. You've given us information about so many aspects of them. And you've actually shown that, uh, you know, fly spec philately can be really exciting. Um, providing, of course, that you have somebody with the artistic merit that you have, which enables you to show what's going on. And I think that's wonderful. Really interesting indeed. I love the idea that it's the first airmail postcard. Um, ever ever produced. I thought that was a really fascinating piece of, of, of news to me. So anyway, Mark, and thank you very much indeed. Um, it's it's almost Indian summer here at the moment. It's 21 degrees here and the, su the sun is shining in. So thank you for, for spending time. I expect it's very dark where you are, um, but uh, it's wonderful here and uh, it's been a great joy for all of us. So I'd like to present you with a certificate, which I think Mark has in hand. And what is more, it's going to be, I hope, video, vid video possible. Here we are. There it is. Wonderful. Um, so, Mark, and I present you with this uh, certificate of appreciation. And thank you indeed, very much indeed, for myself and on behalf of everybody on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And thank you, Mike. Well, thank you, Peter, for that. Um, I don't know whether there will be any more um, informal questions, if I can put it like that, but uh, I've no doubt we'll keep everything rolling for a bit. Um, so I can say that is the end of the formal proceedings, but um, people continue to talk amongst themselves or ask informal questions to you, Mark, and, 
Um, that is it from me. Thank you very much. Thank and you, on, Mike. On that basis, I will stop recording.